Welcome to worship this morning at First Baptist Church in Middlesboro. Glad to see you here. You're always welcome if you're a visitor here. And there are visitor cards in the pews if you'd like to take one and fill that out and put it in an offering plate when it comes by you. Thank you for being here today. You know, Zach isn't here today. He's away with Christy on some vacation time with his family. And we're glad to have Jack Pennington here today and also Sandra sitting down in front. Um, it's like they're here all the time. We just feel like they're part of us. They're not guests, they're members. Um, we have um, a couple of things going on next week. On next Sunday is our Super Bowl of Caring Luncheon. What you do for that luncheon is you bring your favorite soup or chili that you make to share. And you don't have to bring enough for a crowd. You can bring a small amount because we'll take little cups and we'll get tastings of everyone. And there's plenty, so don't bring triple because you'll take a lot home. But if you'll just take a regular size um, serving and bring that next week, we'll have that afterwards. And also, will you bring your checkbook with you or your wallet? We're not gonna, we're going to um, fill the pantries at CCM, but not with the actual food. It's cheaper for them to buy the food if we give them money. So if you'll write a check or bring some um, money for them, it's all gonna go to CCM for our Super Bowl of Caring. And um, next Sunday is Transfiguration Sunday. And it is the last Sunday before we begin Lent. It's that close. So I hope you'll um, be here next Sunday also for that. Will you um, stand and not shake hands, but say hello? <laughs> Don't share any germs today. <clears throat> To begin worship, let's sing, Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. The hymn is number 315 in your hymnal. And let's stand as we sing.
us pray. God, our creator, we bring you praise for who you are, for how you love us, and for how you show us grace. All praise and glory and thanks go to you. Be in our worship this morning. Fill this sanctuary with your presence. Hear our songs and our prayers. Teach us how to love you and others more. Teach us to show your grace to all those around us and accept the praise we bring to you. Amen. You take your bulletin as we read together our litany of invitation and confession. From God comes my salvation. For God alone my soul waits in silence. God alone is my rock and my salvation. God is my fortress, I shall never be shaken. Trusting in the promise of grace, let us pour out our hearts before God. Gracious God, we repent of all the ways we turn from you. You call, but we do not listen. You show us your path, but we prefer our own way. Forgive us and lead us back to you, that we might show mercy to others also. In Jesus' name. This is the word of the Lord. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven by God and you are given new life. Let us lift our voices in thanks and praise to God. Good to be with you. An old coach of mine used to say, every once in a while, I'm going to start the B team so they'll appreciate the varsity. That's what's happening today. And I'm glad to be among uh, Zach's B team. This, as I've told you many times, is a holy place for me. And I love to be here. A reading from the book of Jonah. The Lord's word came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare it the proclamation I'm commanding you. And Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's word. Nineveh was indeed an enormous city, three days walk across. Jonah started into the city walking one day and cried out, just 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, put on mourning clothes from the greatest of them to the least significant. And in verse 10, we read, and their city was blessed. Here ends the first le lesson. Join me now as we prepare for prayer. Dear God, we come at the point of our stillness to that special kind of knowing in which we remember that you are God. As real as the air we breathe, as tangible as the walls around us, we acknowledge your presence here today. And we pray that 
out of the great riches of your truth and love and mercy that you would meet us at the point of our need, that you would enlighten us at the places where we need to grow, and that you would fill us with a sense of your peace that will lessen our fears and heighten our capacity for courage and coping. Guide our time of worship through the one who came and taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. After his baptism, Jesus began his ministry in Galilee, calling disciples from among tradespeople. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus passed along the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away, they left their nets and followed him. After going a little farther, he saw James and John, Zebedee's sons, in their boat repairing the fishing nets. At that very moment, he called them. They followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. Here ends the gospel lesson. Our hymn today of stewardship, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy. The hymn is number 471 as we sing together.
Let us pray. Dear God, for the sunshine, for our warm homes, for the food we eat, thank you. For our friends, for our families, for our church, thank you. For all these blessings and for so much more, we are so grateful. Please accept our offering today in token of this appreciation. And once again, allow us to say thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Shout on Rayon, we're gaining ground. The dead's alive, the lost are found. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing glory. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Savior still the same. What joy the blessed assurance gives. I know that my Redeemer lives. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing glory. When Jesus began his ministry, according to Mark, uh, these were his first words. Repent and believe the good news. It's a kind of uh, special repentance he's talking about here. We all know what it means to say repent. That's not what he says. He says, repent and believe. Now that could be translated, change your mind, change your heart and your mind, change the way you think. Because basically what he's saying to the Jewish people to whom he was sent is it's time to stop living in BC, to stop trying to climb a ladder of good works to God and offering sacrifices where you fail. You don't have to climb a ladder to God. Now God has come down to you. The kingdom of God is near. And it's the same God who said to you at the very beginning of your people, Abraham, I want to bless you. And I want to bless the whole world through you. So that Jesus came to reveal a God who does not need to be persuaded to love you and accept you, but one who wants to love you and accept you because of who God is, not because of who you are. So Jesus comes with a message that blesses from a God who blesses, and it involved changing the way they th thought. I know a lot of Christians, churches that I've served, who still living in BC. They still don't know this God Jesus came to reveal. A God who blesses. It reminds me of a conference I attended when I was pastor here. That's how long ago it was may have told you about some of you. I don't remember. But I'm going to tell you again. That's how, much, that's how much it meant to me. Went to Furman University for a pastor's conference. One of, the, one of the speakers was John Powell, Father John Powell, Catholic priest. And he told us about how he had been chosen to deliver the prestigious lectures at one of the eastern schools 
uh, in the Ivy League. And once you do that, people get your name, and so somebody else asks you. And then somebody else asks you. And he was filling up his calendar, going and giving these lectures at these different schools. And the people at Loyola University, where he was a teacher, he was a junior professor there uh, in Chicago. And uh, the, the, the dean and the president got together and said, well, we might as well have to ask him too. He's going everywhere else. So let's ask him to do our lectures. And he said, now that was different. That was different. Everywhere else I went, they didn't know me. These people knew me. And I was scared to death. He said, my hands were trembling, my knees were shaking, my palms were sweating. I was watching them walk in. And I bowed my head and I said, dear God, I'm scared to death. Please help me. And he said it was like a voice in my heart of hearts, an awareness that came to me. And that awareness said, now, John, you know what you're about to do, and I know what you're about to do. You're about to get up there and show off. You want to impress those people and show them how good you are. No wonder you're nervous. I want you to get up there and bless them by telling them how good I am. And John says, when that awareness came to me, Oh, man, my palms stopped sweating, my knees stopped shaking, my hands stopped trembling, and I could not wait to get up there and try to speak to those people a blessing because I knew them. Over here sat one who was going through cancer treatment. Over there sat another who was battling crippling arthritis. Still over back in the other section was somebody who, who had just gone through the death of a spouse and was in deep grief. And finally, here was a friend of his right up front who was in a terrible battle with alcoholism. And he thought, how can I say what I was going to say in a way that'll bless them, that'll help them? And he said, that, that changed my entire calling. And then he said, it's your calling too. Bless, don't impress. And then he sat down. Well, they had, a, they had a benediction, sang a hymn, benediction, and everybody filed out of the room, everybody but me. I just sat there for what must have been 10 minutes. I sat there alone, deeply moved by that. My God, I've seen a burning bush. You don't get that experience real often. But when it comes, oh my goodness, when it comes. And so it changed who I would be. It changed how I would preach. I remember finding my voice while I was here. You know, preachers have to find their voice. The good thing about the young man you have now is he found his voice younger than most of us, you know, in our camel hair and leather girdle days, trying to act like John the Baptist. When I first came here, I can remember thinking, now I've got to preach like this, because that's what I'd always heard. And occasionally I've got to fuss, because they need it. Well, that wasn't me. I want, who, what the audacity of me? I'm going to fuss at somebody. I don't do that. So I was real uncomfortable until I went to that conference. 
And until I found my voice, until I realized my calling was to bless. And let me say to you, it's not just John Powell and Jack Pennington who, who have received that calling. I believe that we're all called to bless people with the hope and grace and love of God. And there's so many ways we can do that. But there are so many people still living in B.C. Because they went to the same church as I went to growing up. And uh, they kept us in B.C. Jesus didn't want that. And so knowing that he would one day die, he did not want his message to die with him. He called his disciples. We read about it today. I want you fellows to observe what I'm doing here now, and I want you to do the same thing. The prophets were called that way. Jonah was just one of them we read today. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to bless. He wanted to get them. But God said, I want you to go and tell them that their place is just not going to last. I mean, if they keep on this track, they're going to be wiped out you don't exist as a country like that so he thought good good I can get them and they uh, they said oh well we must change well that aggravated Jonah to death you know just aggravated to death I didn't expect you to change now what now now what but God blessed those people even though Jonah didn't even want to go. He sulked. He sulked under a vine for shade. And the, sh the sun wilted the vine. And he was miserable about that. And God said, you're worried about a vine? I, I love those people. I want them blessed. And so all of the disciples begin with probably saying, I don't know about following this guy. I mean, after all, I'm married. I got, a, I got a family. But they had to change their mind. They had to change their mind and get themselves a new calling. Now, that's another one of those mystical words that you just hear preachers talk about. Calling. Well, he got the call. He what? He got the call. He did. I was in seminary and I went to my favorite professor and I said, hey, he was really good. He was good. I said, come here. What's a call? I don't want to be here under false pretenses. But my phone hasn't rung. He looked at me, which he always did, over the top of his glasses. And he said, Jack, my boy, God calls everyone and then has to make do with those who say yes. Wow. Another one of those burning bushes. It's very true. I think he's right. A calling is think about what you most like to do in life. Something you would do for free. Something that puts energy in you instead of taking it out of you. And then use that to bless other people. Whether it's your vocation or not. There is no better example of that in the Bible than Moses. God wanted to bless the Hebrews. They were in slavery in Egypt. My goodness 400 years, and God wants that to stop. So he asks Moses to join him. But, but Moses, uh, he's going to have to change his mind because he's been in the desert a long time tending sheep, and he's lost all the confidence he ever had, and he begins to make excuses. Moses, I want you to go do this. Let's bless them. Let's get them out of slavery. And he says things like, 
well, you know, I'm a wanted man back down there in Egypt, and uh, not only that, but uh, I know that Pharaoh. I went to high school with him. I knew his daddy. He ran me out of there. And to be honest with you, they're not about to let those slaves go. And I, I, I've just forgotten all the Egyptian I ever knew, Lord. And besides all that, I to st 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 stutter. And then he said, what'd you say your name was? And therein is one of the great puzzles in the Hebrew Bible because Hebrew scholars differ about how to translate what God said. What'd you say your name was? The one you read the most is, I am that I am. Well, that sounds sort of like something God would say, but I don't know what it means. Also, it can be translated, I will be who I will be. Okay, pretty much the same thing. You know what my favorite translation is? I wish it were in all the Bibles because it's the best translation I have heard. And it's equally correct. Who did you say you were? I am for you, and I will be there for you. Now, how do you like that? The next time you're saying your prayers to God and you wonder who you're talking to, it's the one who says, I am for you, and I will be there for you. It was that word from God that caused Moses to change his mind. He repented and believed the good news. It's the personality of Jesus that did the same thing for these disciples. Made them all believe, made them all repent of their way, old way of thinking and follow a new leader who's got a totally different message from anything they've ever heard. It was because they knew Jesus was for them and would be there for them. I think just as surely Jesus is saying to you and me today, follow me and I will make you blessers of people. Repent and believe the good news. I want to bless everyone and I want to do it through you. People need to know that I love them unconditionally, that they don't have to earn it, and that they can never, ever forfeit it. I love them because of who I am, not because of who they are, so it doesn't ever change. Let them see that in you. They need to know I forgive them. Many of them uh, have done something they're ashamed of. They feel worthless now and hopeless. I want you to know, I want them to know that I've already forgiven them and I want you to let it be shown in you. They've already been forgiven. Let them see it in you. They need to know they're not disqualified and they're not shut out. A sinner in Jesus' day was the one who was shut out. That's what that word sinner comes from. It's somebody who has repeated the same sin enough that the synagogue kicks them out. And they say, you can't ever come in here again. They're shut out. And that's not the God Jesus came to reveal. Let people know that I have not given up on them and I will not give up on them ever. Let them see that in you. It's when God's grace flows through some person that we can hear it and feel it best. And you know what? When it goes through you, it forgives you on the way through. It's like soap. 
If you just put a lot of soap on a piece of cloth, nobody's going to want to wear it. It's just got soap on it. But if you let it wash through the garment, now you've got a clean garment. When forgiveness is stored in you, it doesn't do much. doesn't mean much. You want to really feel forgiven? Let it flow through you to somebody else. That's when you'll know you're forgiven too. This is what God is calling his children to be. This is what it is to be a bless or or a bless er as the case may be. The gospel is just a great blessing, and that's why they call it the good news. I think our calling is a lot like that old TV show that they had on the air when I was a little boy. It was called The Millionaire. Some of you uh, can remember that if you were born in the 1850s. Uh, the early days of television. Uh, the, the show was called A, a, a Millionaire, and, and, and it consisted of this, a multimillionaire by the name of John Beresford Tipton decided he was going to give a cashier's check to a needy but unsuspecting soul every single week. And the show was about how that changed people's lives. And the man who delivered the check and the good news was his secretary. It was a man named Michael Anthony. And as a boy, I guess this was an inclination of what I was going to be when I grew up. But as a boy, I sat there watching that every week. I loved that. And I did not think, boy, I wish I was that multi-millionaire giving that money away. Nope. You know what I thought? I wish I could be his secretary. What a good job. Just go around every week and say, uh, I have something for you. Mm -hmm. And just watch the joy to be able to deliver that. What a wonderful job that would be. But I have discovered you and I have a greater calling still. We are called to take the blessing of God, something that people hear about, but they don't know it unless they see it. And here we are, the secretaries that can take that blessing. What a job that is. In the famous play Beckett, the king has made his old carousing partner, Beckett, the archbishop of the church because he knows Beckett will be complicit with his wishes. And he wants to bring the church under the king's control, so I'll put Beckett in there, make him the archbishop, and we'll get this thing going. But he didn't count on the fact that Beckett has changed his mind. So the king says, oh, come on, Beckett. Don't you remember when we used to go to the brothels together and get drunk together? We're old buddies, you and I. Come on now. You're not acting like yourself. And Beckett says, perhaps I'm not like myself, for I have been called. I've been called. I felt like for the first time in my life, I've been entrusted with something important. So have you. So have I. My teacher was right when he said, God calls everyone and then has to make do with those who say yes. What will you say?
Let's stand together and sing our hymn of opportunity, number 586. Glad you were here for worship this morning as we praise God together. And we're thankful that Jack and Sandra were here today and we heard Jack's good words. And uh, as he leads us in a benediction afterwards, I hope you'll greet him at the door too. Jerry Ford was president when I was up here as a pastor. And he has a, a Christmas card that he sent out every year that had this wonderful message, and I share it with you uh, for our closing blessing. May this new year bring more wisdom to the way we look at the world and more love to the way we live in it. Amen. Amen.